Uh, let's look at the process from start to finish. Hopefully you've kind of been reading this as I've been talking, uh, so I won't go through every single thing, but this is kind of a typical process in a nutshell for me. Uh, so the most important part of that is getting the gig. I think that's the hardest part, and you know that's that's the one that everybody wants to know how to do. And if I had an answer for you, then I, you know, I, I have a lot more money than I do now. Um, I think that's probably one of the hardest parts of this entire business is getting the actual work. I've had very I've had very good luck at like once you can get in that room, once you can meet the people, once you can do those things, to be invited back. But that's probably the hardest part is to like is to get into that room for the first time. Once you got the gig, however you've gotten it, uh, then we have a lot of meetings. We go through all these various, you know, production meeting after production meeting, analysis, talking about the script. That's where the collaboration really begins. And sometimes it even begins as we're getting the gig. So uh, if, if I'm talking to a director about a potential show before I've been hired, I mean, that's kind of part of the collaborative process right there. We're both, we're figuring out how we're going to work together as, as collaborators. And we're also kind of already brainstorming ideas for the show to a certain extent. Because we want, I, for me, I want to see like, is this a project that I want to work on? I, you know, I, I want to do something that I'm going to enjoy. I don't want to just do any old thing. Ask me again in a few months when I don't have any work and I'll, I'll do, I'll light anything you want me to light. And then for the director, it's also then for the director or the producer to see kind of my style and how I work and the ideas that I bring to the table. So it's important. And then we go through all this other stuff that I'm going to show you. So question came in about what the team is and what that means. So this was the team for Mamma Mia in the park. I'm in the center there. I, I typically on most of my shows, I have uh, an associate designer or two associates. Uh, sometimes I'll have assistant designers. The difference for that, um, there's kind of, uh, there's a few generally accepted differences for me and my team, what that usually means is the associate is somebody who I trust. Well, I, I trust everybody on my team, but I, I trust to make artistic decisions in my absence is the best way to put it versus the assistant who is there to help facilitate work notes, paperwork, things like that. Um, that's kind of the way I approach it. So, you know, on this particular show, Dalton and Abby were both associates on this because they both were, you know, Abby was doing follow spots. Dalton was, uh, was, well, he was also programming. We'll get to that in a second, but I trust very much. I trust both of them to make decisions when I can't be there or, you know, we work very much as a team together. On the shows we do at city Springs, Dalton and Abby also work with me, but again, as co-associates and really at, at, at those shows, we, all three of us are doing like one and one third job because there's that job of like an assistant that uh, is kind of being split between all three of us. And I like to say, especially there, like, yeah, there's titles, like I'm the designer, they're the associates, but it's very much the three of us making the show together. Uh, really more than the three of us, it's the, it's the production electricians, it's the follow spot operators, all of us kind of coming together to make the show happen. Uh, production electrician, so production electrician is going to be the person who is doing all of the hanging of the fixtures, or well, the person who's supervising all the hanging of the fixtures. Uh, this can be, you know, some people interchange the term with master electrician or head electrician. Um, depending on where you're working, those things are going to have different meanings. For me, in most of my shows, if it's a union, if, if the crew is a union crew, what that typically would mean is my production electrician would be the person that has been hired by the theater company or by the production itself to to be in charge of all of the nuts and bolts of the electric of the lighting package. The head electrician is going to be whoever from the local is the head elect is the, is the person who's in charge of the electricians that are on that local IOTC crew for that call. Uh, and then a master electrician, again, like I, I don't really use that term for most of the shows I do, but that uh, it's used a lot in regional theater for, you know, they're the person who is, who is kind of the in-house person doing all of the electrician work also could potentially mean like we have uh, in Atlanta, we have a house electrician as well. Who, he's the person who works for the house. He does certain things for us and they, they work together with our head electrician, with our production electrician, with our associates, with, our, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, so then programmer. So another question had come in before about if I program the board myself or if other people do that. So again, this really depends on the project that I'm working on. I try to always have a programmer whenever I can uh, with certain caveats. So what I, the big thing for me is, you know, I know EOS really well. And uh, when I'm hired to design a show, I want to be hired to design the show. I don't want to be hired to train a person how to use the console. I don't want to, you know, I don't mind doing those things. I enjoy doing those things. 
but when we're in the heat of the moment and we're in the middle of a tech rehearsal, I don't want to have to be teaching a board op or, a, excuse me, a, a, a programmer how to program. Uh, if, if, I, if I'm speaking just in keystroke, if I'm saying channel one at full, record Q2, let's make that up, you know, block enter, then I, I do not enjoy that process at all. Because now in my head, I'm like, well, why am I, why am I not just doing it myself? Because I'm already putting all of my energy into telling you exactly what to do. Why am I not just doing it myself? So if it's a small show or if it's a show that has an inexperienced programmer, um, I try to try to do it myself. On my larger shows, um, I, I usually Dalton is Dalton Hamilton is my go-to programmer and associate on those shows. Um, and uh, the question just came in: Do you do you find it hard to have a separation between designer and programmer? Uh, no. So that's actually what I'm about to get at. Like again, like Dalton and I and, and Abby too, we're, we're very much co-designing the show. Dalton happens to be the one pushing those buttons on the console, um, but. We're, we're, we're all doing the exact same work. Now, if I was working with a programmer I had never worked before, I wouldn't have necessarily the same level of trust and wouldn't give the same amount of control over. Um, but because I've worked with these people so many times on so many different projects, we know how each other work, we know what we want, uh, and it works out really well. So a good example of that is uh, a big part of my process is at the like final dress rehearsal to walk around the theater and take photos of the show. Uh, of course, that's to get photos for my portfolio, but it also allows me to really see the show from a whole bunch of other angles that I wouldn't necessarily see it from if I was just sitting at the tech table all the time. I always try during tech to move around whenever I can. It's just not always possible. So when I'm doing those things, I have to trust that the people that Abby and that Dalton or whoever my associates and programmers are, that they can make big changes that might need to, or changes that might need to be made without me having to say anything. You know, for an example, I, you know, say the actor has been consistently standing a foot or so out of their light. I, I've been down in the house taking a photo before and I'll see Dalton just remove that moving light into a different position or touch up the edge or something like that. And that's perfectly fine. Um, you know, he would never go in and, and change the entire look of a scene without talking about it. But we very much have that relationship where we would, you know, we, we, we work well together like that. Hopefully that answers that question a bit. Um, so we have follow spot operators, <laughs> lighting vendors, interns, uh, all the way on the left there you see Sebastian. Uh, Sebastian's our account rep from Four Wall down in Orlando. Um, he came out for opening night of this particular show. Uh, and that's, you know, those relationships you form, you know, this business is all about relationships. So forming those relationships with your shops, with your vendors are really important. So I can call and be like, hey, I got the show. I really need a favor. I really need this. We've got that relationship and we can make that happen. Uh, and then also in this photo next to Abby here, you see Ben, who's I believe on this call. I think I saw his name. Uh, ben was our intern on this show. Uh, so this was, Ben was a high school student. Um, he's now no longer a high school student, which makes me feel incredibly old because I taught his brother, his older brother in high school. Um, and Ben was our intern on the show. So Ben came out with us for a few years and kind of just learned the ropes, learned design, learned you know, our process and how we work. And I've since hired him on several projects uh, as well. Um, actually, I think on this particular show, Abby was not able to, to be there one night for tech, so we paid Ben to, to sit in and call follow spots for that night, which was pretty cool. He did a really great job. Um, a lot of opinions on internships and stuff, but this is not the time or place, so stick around after we can talk about it if anybody wants to talk about that. But uh, you should get paid for your work. If you're an intern, you should, be, you should either be there to learn or you should be getting paid for your work. So let's talk about the design process. Um, so the design process for the park shows starts off with this. This is the white model. Um, for those of you who've been doing this a long time, you know this is not a, uh, not, the, not the foam core white model that you might be used to uh, from, from back in the day. This is a, all done in SketchUp. The seeing designer, Jared, uh, who designs there every year, he does all of it in SketchUp. Uh, this is kind of like the first proof of concept for the show. Um, again, this is cool because we're starting with that field. So we're starting with this grass field and everything we're doing is built up from there. So you can see all of our lighting positions are built with scaffolding. Actually, the stage deck itself, that's like a, a four foot scaffolding with a, with a deck surface over top of it. Uh, we take this white model, we go back and forth, we talk, we, you know, we have meetings after meetings after meetings. And then eventually we get into more of a final rendering, final model of the whole thing. So this was kind of what, the, what that what that white model turned into and is pretty pretty close to what the what the, the final ended up looking like so we had this really cool wall in the background we had this uh, like a built-in ground row cover for it um, you see our trusses were already in there 
we kind of use a similar footprint in the park every year. This is this was supposed to be my seventh or eighth year doing it, and hopefully, if it still happens in October, I'll keep that streak alive. I told him I want to get to ten years, and then I'll and then I'll move on. But we'll see. Um, so I'm talking more lighting specifically then, uh, equipment selection is probably the hardest part of this process. So when you're walking into a normal theater, uh, other than like Broadway, you pretty much are working with a set, a set number of instruments that the house already owns. You might have a small rental budget or a medium or a large rental budget, which is great. But typically most theater companies, at least in the United States, have, have a stock of inventory. So I don't really have a, necessarily a lot of choice of what I use. I have, to, I have to use whatever they have and hopefully bring something in if I can. So with the, with, the, with the park show, it's very challenging because it's outside, basically right on the Gulf of Mexico, at the start of the rainy season in Florida, and all of the gear has to be out there for about six to seven weeks. <coughs> Excuse me. So all of those things right there make it very hard to get gear. When I first started doing this show seven years ago, all we could have was we had 30 Source 4s, we had, I think, 20 park hands, and we had a set of Aqua Ram scrollers from PRG in, in New York City, like the only Aqua Rams that they owned that were shared, like Shakespeare and the, uh, the public in the park would have them, and then they would be shipped for American Stage in the Park. So when I took over that year, that kind of sucked. Um, but the thing was, like, there was no waterproof gear out there. You know, there was some, maybe some LED stuff happening, but it wasn't really much of it. Um, and what there was, wasn't very good. It, what I, I wouldn't want to use it on stage. So over the years, as, as technology has progressed, now I've got all kinds of cool waterproof stuff that I can use. So last year was our first year using water or using moving lights that weren't in some kind of enclosures. We used five of the Alation Proteus hybrids out there. Uh, this coming year, we're actually going to have, I believe, 22 moving lights. It's going to be a mix of the Proteus hybrids and the, the Chave Maverick washes. Now, again, like the question is, would I use those Maverick washes in a, in a, in a theater show if it wasn't outside? And the answer is probably not because I've got 50 other choices that are brighter or that have better color or any number of, of reasons. Um, but when we're outside, I'm limited to what I can get that's waterproof. And then in addition to that, I'm also limited to what the rental shops have. So this back in the day was a PRG show. Uh, three years ago or so maybe when For All was starting to float the idea of doing a Orlando office, um, I, I've been working with the New York office on a lot of shows and I was talking to the Matt, uh, uh, excuse me, Phil Foline, uh, rest in peace, who at the time was my account rep, uh, talking to me about this cool project I had and it kind of turned into this like, all right, well, we're going to ship all the gear down and then leave it in the Florida office when it opens. And now that's, they've become our partner out there in the park. Um, but all that to be said, I'm limited to what they have in stock because, uh, you know, it, there's a decent budget on this show, but the budget is not big enough where they're going to go out and buy a whole bunch of fixtures for me to use unless they have other people who are also going to be using them. Um, so I'm gonna to get to a couple of those questions that are coming in in a second. I wanna kinda of jump through this a little bit because I'm running very long and I apologize for that. Um, so yeah, so we're going through, this is uh, equipment revision after equipment revision and this is very much most game of budget. So <clears throat> if, if I had an unlimited budget, I would design, I'd put fixtures everywhere I want them, I would send that shop order out, it would come in and I'd be done. But we know that in the real world, it just does not work that way. So I'm very much, you know, I might design the show with 10 moving lights, and then as we go through the budget process, I can only afford eight moving lights. So then I'll readjust the design to fit what we can afford. Um, the, uh, this just lasts usually a couple of weeks. So we go back and forth. Four Wall helps as much as they can. Um, they actually, they're a, a, a title sponsor of this particular production. So that also helps with cost a little bit. Um, but there's still a budget that has to be worked out. Um, all right, let me answer a couple of these questions that are specific here. Uh, when I say that I have an account rep, does, does that mean I rent through a personal account and not the theater company? So uh, most of the productions that I'm working on, uh, I am, I am my, my team and I are the ones dealing with the shop. Um, most of the, just, that's just how most of the projects that I've worked on has happened. Sometimes it's a production manager, but most of the time I take over that communication uh, to where we can kind of just give the producer, all right, here's, here's quote A, here's quote B. 
here's a list of everywhere that you need to send checks to, and then they're the ones dealing with actually paying and the insurance and everything like that. I do, I mean, I, I of course, I do have an account with PRG, with Four Well, with Christie, with all of those major companies. That when I need, if I'm doing like a one-off or an event or something like that, and I am doing it, then I'll rent it. Um, but I try to let other people's insurance policies handle this kind of stuff as much as possible, because. Um, I'm one person and my insurance policy covers a relatively small amount of gear. So, um, and then speaking of gear, then uh, I don't have much of a personal inventory. When I lived in Florida, I had some stuff. I had a lot of scroll. I still have a lot of scrollers actually that I'm trying to sell. So send me a message if anybody wants to buy any color Rams if you're in Nashville. Um, most of the gear that I own now is all control based. So I have an ION, I have all kinds of networking gear, I have uh, Nomad keys, I have all that kind of stuff. Because that's the stuff, and I have computer monitors, because that's the stuff that I'm going into these theaters and needing. Um, I don't really, I had a couple of moving lights 15 years ago, but, you know, I used them on five shows, they paid for the, you know, I got them paid for, and then I didn't want to deal with the maintenance anymore. So, and I also just don't have a, I don't have a shop or anything like that. So. Okay, so back to the, back to the thing here. Um... So we go through all these revisions, and then finally we get it into Capture. So Capture is our visualization program that we use. Um, you've, if you follow me on Instagram, you've seen me post a lot of stuff about Capture, especially in the park. Um, one of the challenges of the park, in addition to all this other stuff, is that we can only program at night. Like if we want to, if we want to work in the theater, we have to wait till the sun goes down to do that. So being able to have a visualizer really, really helps with this. Um, I'm able to basically take all of the SketchUp stuff that was done by the scenic excuse me, by the scenic designer, import that right into Capture, and then start dropping in actual lighting fixtures where I want them. Uh, I actually do this in the park before we even touch Vectorworks. So I'll drop a light in, I'll make sure it can hit where it needs to hit, and then I'll have I'll have the Capture open on one monitor, and on my other monitor I'll have the Vectorworks drawing and kind of work back and forth between the two. Um, from there we do all kinds of paperwork, all kinds of plots. Uh, the park show now has 13 pages for the lighting plot. It doesn't seem like it's that complicated of a rig and it's really not, uh, but we do, we do all kinds of detail plates for all the data runs, all that kind of stuff. Because again, we're not, you know, when you go into a theater, there's dimmers, there's circuits, there's all that stuff already exists. Sometimes there's gateways, there's data distribution. When we're doing this show, we start with a grass field. And so we're putting in, we're bringing in all of that data distribution, we're bringing in all that power distribution, and all of it has to be rented. Um, and the, the four wall shop is about two and a half hours away in Orlando. So it's not necessarily an easy thing if we forget a bunch of stuff to, to keep shipping it back and forth. So we try to figure out literally every single circuit, like what that circuit is gonna need, what cable it's gonna need, figure that all out in advance, and then detail that all out in the paperwork so that we don't have to do a whole bunch of back and forth and ads and stuff like that. Obviously there's spares and, and, and extra equipment added, but um, we lay out all of our circuits, we do detail plates, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. We do a control system riser. So again, we're bringing in an entire, uh, <laughs> It's right here. So we're bringing in an entire control system for this. This might be a poor quality photo. Oh, no, it's not. I can zoom it around. Um, I, I, we, we, we designate exactly what every single wire that's in this rig from Ethernet cable to USB cable has a number attached to it. So L001 is going to be, you know, coming out of the Ethernet port A on the ION going into this switch. And the reason this is important is because five weeks into this run, after the, the rain has happened and everything is muddy, if something breaks, we want the electricians who are on site to have a very clear map of exactly what each cable is, where it's running, what it's supposed to be plugged into. Um, they've had emergencies in the past where you know it started to thunderstorm. They've had to strike a bunch of stuff really quickly and maybe something gets unplugged. If everything isn't clearly labeled and there isn't some kind of a clear, concise map to all of that, then it's gonna make installing it again when all the people who designed it are long gone a month prior, it's gonna make it impossible. So on this, we, we, we designate every single port for every single thing. Uh, on this, we also have IP addresses, user numbers for every single component. Um, you know, here this integrates with the show control with, with Steve, who was our sound designer. So there was MIDI, there was OSC, there was SMPTE going on. Um, all of it is all 
all done. And this also includes then the position, so all my data lines. So coming out of this opto splitter, line 25 went to the stage right truss and then continued on to the stage right scaffolding and then got a terminator. And there's, there's other pages of this paperwork that detail every single fixture in order of, of where in that data line it is, et cetera, et cetera. Now we don't necessarily do that level of detail of paperwork for most of our projects. This is kind of unique to this park show. Um, typically for other shows, obviously there's schedules that exist, all of the all of the addresses are figured out, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and the production electricians are drawing out cable and stuff like that. But uh, this show is probably the most in-depth paperwork package that we do, just because again, we're bringing it all in from the ground up. So from there we go in and we do all kinds of other paperwork, instrument schedules, things like that. Um, I, again, I have a paperwork session next week where we'll all dive in depth into lighting paperwork. So if you're excited about that, Come on out. Um, all of this is done in my own uh, FileMaker based program called the Paperwork Management Portal, which I'm also going to do a live demo of on Sunday afternoon. So check in on that again on my website. Um, uh, another question here do you, do, you, do you just have to know that much about hookup and connections, or do you send it to the PE and they fix it if it won't work? So uh, on most of my shows, the PE does all of that stuff. Like as a designer, all I really wanted, all I really want to worry about as a theatrical lighting designer is to say, when I say channel one at full, I just want that light to come on at full. Or when I say the downright blue to come on at full, I want that to happen. So when I'm dealing with shows, especially like City Springs and places and other larger theaters like that, I, I'm focused on more on the artistic side of it. I'm still working a little bit behind the scenes on some of the deals with vendors and stuff like that. Um, but other people are doing that. With this show, um, the production electrician contract, there's a lot of, this goes into a whole other discussion about contracts and fees and all that kind of stuff. Um, we just try to, we just try to do as much of it as possible to take some of the workload off of that electrician. And also because the electrician's con, basically the electrician's contract doesn't start until right before the show. I've got to have all this gear nailed down sometimes a month or so before that all happens. So I want to go in and get it all get reserved and everything and, and basically hand the production electrician a map of what to do. Um, and obviously there's some back and forth on that. Like if they have something they want to do differently, that all, you know, we have that kind of relationship with the electricians we work with. So it works out. Um, Kyle asked, what program do we generate the control riser in? That was all just done in Vectorworks. I know there's all kinds of other, uh, there's great like uh, signal flow programs and stuff like that. And maybe on this, this hiatus, I'll learn some of them. But I just have a, I have a resource folder full of like a 15 inch 2017 MacBook Pro and all those things with all the ports. And so I can drop all those things in really easily. Um, okay, back to the presentation. Uh, magic sheets, we make magic sheets. So most of you, some of you, if you uh, have been following me for a while, this might've been your first kind of introduction to my work was my magic sheets on social media. Um, magic sheet is basically, you know, where everything is and where it's pointing. I'm able to take all of those 13 pages of plot down and put them onto one piece of paper. Uh, so if you scan this code on your phones, you can see uh, this is an article that I wrote couple years ago now on magic sheets and how they work. There's also a two hour live stream video there of me making a magic sheet, um, which sounds like torture to me, but people seem to enjoy it. So go check that out. Um, but yeah, that's magic sheets. Oh, that page is in there twice. Uh, so back to the control system then, you can see one of the challenges of this is we have to bring it out every night. So there is a booth you can see in the very back over here, but that booth, uh, is very far away from the stage. So much like a tech table in a regular theater, we wanna be a lot closer to the stage in order to program the show. Um, we bring out the entire, the, all these tables, actually we leave everything on the table, we pick up the table and take it into a little, uh, like one of those storage pods where we store it during the day. Um, and other times, you can see here, it starts to drizzle a little bit while we're doing it. So this was, we were doing press photos that night and so uh, started a little bit of drizzle coming, and so they ran and got a tarp, and Dalton ended up lighting the press photos underneath the tarp as Ben and Abby held up the tarp for him to protect from water. Uh, in one of my older presentations, my, I think my second or third year doing this show, uh, we were programming overnight. It was probably about 3.30, 4 a.m., and all of a sudden the sprinklers in the field turned on because they had forgotten to call the city to have them turned off. 
and so we threw like folding chairs over them like we're frantically trying to save all this gear and it was it was a whole thing uh, we've got a photo of that somewhere uh so again we use etc products for basically all of my theater work is in the etc family it's all eos based um some of my corporate work i'm on ma now um, but all my theater stuff is all eos based we do a lot of multi-user stuff um, which some of you saw probably I posted a couple weeks ago, some, some pictures of that all kind of working and how that works. Um, integrates with my paperwork software. Uh, it allows all of us, to, everybody on the team to be able to do what they need to do in the lighting system um, and uh, not interfere with what other people are doing. So I had a lot of questions on that a couple weeks ago when I posted it and I started working on a blog explaining it all and kind of doing some pictures and I just haven't had a chance to finish it yet. So I will soon. But if you're not familiar with multi-user stuff in EOS, check out the videos, check out the manual on the ETC website. Um, you'll start finding it very useful. Even if you're just working in your schools and you're doing, you know, you, you, have, a, you have a light board and maybe a, a Nomad remote or something like that. Um, so, <clears throat> After we've got everything designed and all that's done, we go and we do a shop prep day. So this was, you know, again, this, this year there wasn't a whole lot of gear this past year. We have a lot more coming out this year. Um, but we, uh, the shop prep is done. We basically, we go and we put, when we say we, I mean somebody on the team. I haven't, I haven't done the shop prep in a couple of years now. But we print labels for every single fixture. We set all the addresses on every single fixture. We prepare our cable looms. We label all of our connectors, all of our cable. They actually lay out the truss on the ground as well and then put you know, labels on the truss of what fixture goes where so that at load in, all you have to do is you, know, uh, you line up, okay, this, this number goes on this, this truss, this number goes on this truss, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, we also color code them so you can kind of see on these yokes, there's some colored E-tape. Uh, Stage left truss was yellow, stage right was red. So it makes it really easy, especially because in the, in the load in we don't always have uh, electricians on it. Sometimes we have some carpenters, we have whoever is on the theater staff. And so being able to say, if you see red, take it to this position, hang it wherever the number matches, it makes it really simple. And again, looking a month into the future, if, you, if something breaks, you wanna be able to trace all that back. So doing that prep and having everything labeled and tested and working in the shop is also really important. So usually the day or two after shop prep, load-in starts. <coughs> um, so this is kind of, this is cool. One of the board members from the theater lives in a high-rise condo building downtown in St. Pete, and he posts photos every night as soon as they start loading in the set. And so you, again, you can see just how close this is to the water out there. Um, he did, one year we did hairspray, and he posted a live video of it. And I was very confused because it seemed like the stage manager was calling all of my uh, like button cues uh, very late. Um, and what I realized is that uh, he was so far away that there was a, uh, excuse me, they were calling the button cues early because he was so far away that I was seeing, the, the, you know, you could see the lights changing before the audio was reaching his camera all the way back on his balcony. So there was almost a full second delay. It was kind of a cool thing. Uh, we've also always said that we really want to, we'll, we'll throw some like super troopers up in his apartment one day and do our follow spots from all the way back there, but I don't think he'll let us do that. Um, so again, load-in happens. We actually, they use a crane to lift everything up. So they start, they prep all the trusses on the ground. You can see the labels are all on there. Uh, and then a crane comes in, they lift those trusses up into position. Uh, the crane operator says it's usually the same crane operator every year and he, he gets a kick out of it because it's not like anything else he gets to do. Um, but they lift them right up, they drop them down. They all connect to the scaffolding, uh, both with cheese burrows and they also ratchet strap it. I don't think the ratchet straps are really necessary, but they cheese burrow it. Uh, and on some of the positions, we also pipe down to kind of do some, some extra angles and stuff like that uh, for extra bracing. Um, and again, this, this year you can see that these, are, these Proteus hybrids are fully waterproof, so we didn't have to have giant domes out there last year, which was a game changer. Um, whoops, I messed up, there we go. Uh, and then we focus. So typically, uh, this is a question I get a lot. I don't focus a lot of my own shows, and that's not out of, well, somewhat out of preference, but a lot of it is because I'm usually working on other projects. So a lot of the times, like, I'm, uh, my team and I will go back to back to back on a lot of shows because theaters love to book everything at the same time. So we'll go for, like, two or three months solid, and then it'll be, like, a month off, and then two or three more months, and then a month off. So being able to send somebody else to focus the show while I'm in like a final dress rehearsal for another project is super useful. 
and again, because I work with the same people so often, they know what I want and what, what kind of look I'm going for. And also it's not like, it's not super hard to focus a show. If you, you know, I, I could do a 20 minute phone call with you, talk you through the systems and stuff like that. And you could probably focus a show. It's not, it's not super hard to focus one of my shows. Um, so Abby ran the focus for this. You can see her face is on fire there from all the lights being focused on her at once. Um, and then another part of this show that we do that's slightly different than other projects is we actually attend the, the SITS Pro. Uh, if you're not familiar with the term SITS Pro, that's an opera term that's basically the first time the orchestra and the performers sing and play together as a group. Um, so with a lot of the shows that we do that use time code, this is our first chance to learn all of those time code stamps and it saves a lot of programming time down the line. So I'm gonna play this video. I'm not sure if there's sound in it or not. So you can see basically what we're doing is we're they're playing back with the click track. I don't know if you could hear that or not, I don't know if it's sharing the audio properly, um, but you could hear the click actually running in the room. Um, typically that click would only be in the, in, the, in the musician's ears, but we're getting a time code signal from that. And so we're sitting there during, during the sits probe and we're learning all of those time code stamps as they come in. You can note, if you notice on this cue sheet, uh, if you're familiar with EOS, you probably notice that there's no timing data recorded in any of these cues. Uh, and that's because there's no actual values recorded in any of them yet. All we have in them are basically just empty queues with labels. And so when we have it set up like that, we're able to jump in at any part of the show and record queues and not have to worry about where we are. Uh, you know, we have already got our blocks put in. We don't have to worry about tracking from other places or jumping around. We already have the labels. We already have the, the numbers put in so we can, we can quickly and easily work. And it also allows us to drop in all these timestamps like this. Um, so then uh, Dalton and I do a lot of previs work on this. So again, uh, so questions came in, what would be the advantage of time code as opposed to manually calling light cues? I will show you that in one second because I have another video to show you, um, but I'll, I'll get to that. So we do previs. So again, we can't work in the, in the field until after dark. So we, this was actually, we set it up at Dalton's house because he lives down in St. Pete in Clearwater area. We had a big TV there. Uh, we had the eye on and we did a lot, as much of the pre-programming as we can, and then we touched it up when we got to the space. Uh, we also discovered that we could do, I'm gonna play this video, I'm gonna mute it. Um, the front of house trailer was not occupied until the first preview. So we ended up moving our entire previs operation inside of this air conditioned storage trailer. And what we were able to do, you can see that's the table right there from the, from the outside that you saw earlier. So when we were done with previs for the day, we would shut everything down and take the table right outside in the field, plop it down, work on the show, pack it back up, take it back in the previs trailer for the next day. Uh, this coming year, we're gonna leave a network line ran into it so the previs can be working in the background while we're doing it for no real reason other than it would be kind of fun. Um, we also spent a lot of time in that watching uh, uh, ABBA music videos that are terrible. They're just, they're bad, they're very bad. Um, and then we get into tech rehearsals. So after all, all of a sudden done, we finally get to like sit down, work with the cast and work and, and create the show that we're trying to create. So what you're looking at right now, this is kind of a view looking from the stage back. There's the follow spot tower. The, that board member lives up in these apartments up in here. So it's like the perfect follow spot position if you would let us do it. Um, we do video. My team also does, this is kind of a weird cross departmental thing, but my team also does a video system for this. Typically video and all that kind of stuff would fall to the audio department, like queuing video. Um, but this was kind of just like seven years ago, I was the one who knew how to do it and I had the equipment. So we did it and now like we rent all this stuff to them. So that's also some gear that I own. Um, but you know, the, the cast can see the conductor there. And then during tech rehearsals, we like to have a lot of fun. So like one year we did s'mores in the park. We brought these little like catering chafing dish warmers out there and we made s'mores. We've done Hawaiian nights. We've done all kinds of different themes. Cause it kind of, it kind of sucks to be working outside for two weeks in Florida. Um, so we try to make it as fun as we can. Uh, and then we get into tech rehearsals. 
Here's another example. This is Dalton learning some time code stamps. And so what he's doing right now is you can see in the background, this was the on track and we had missed a couple of light cues the last time we did it. And so he was going back through and adding those in. And so Natalie, this will answer your question. So the question was, what, what's the advantage of time code as to manually calling lighting cues? So with time code, it allows us to be way more intricate and do way more things uh, with, with the music than, than a human could necessarily operate. So in this particular show, the stage manager actually runs the console. So we don't have a board op who could like learn the music and like play it all. Uh, we have a stage manager who's calling, she's calling the show for herself, but she's also calling stuff backstage. She's dealing with a whole bunch of stuff. So we try to take some of that off of her plate for one thing. So she can say, all right, this is a really, you know, there's 300 cues in this sequence. I'm not going to think about it. I'm just going to let it run. They still have, the stage manager still has those cues in their book. Worst case if they would have to, but sometimes it, it kind of, kind of sucks if that happens. Um, the, be the better example of that is this. So the EOS can learn all kinds of things with time code. So sure, you can play back a cue list. That's easy. You know, have it play back cues at a certain time. But it can also memorize sub button bumps. It can memorize macros being triggered. So in this little video, I'm going to show you, I'm not going to show you the whole thing, but it's Dalton and I uh, adding in some accent hits on sub bumps uh, and learning them to the time code. <laughs> So you can see Dalton there is working. If you could hear it, and voulez-vous, every time they go, aha, uh -huh, he was doing a sub down on the first one and a sub up on the second one. And so what that did is every time we did that, it recorded the timestamp for those things and it would play it back. And that was a little bit easier than recording you know, 80 cues to do it all. It was just, let's have two looks on a sub, a sub on, sub off, and let's, let's drop that in. <laughs> this was my other favorite part is when the director came up to ask me a question in the middle of trying to do this. And I was like, yeah, 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 that's great. I'll, I'll be back with you in a second. Um, so hopefully that answers your question there a little bit, Allie. The other cool thing we were able to do with it uh, was, let me see, I could, I could, I'll show you this for those of you who stick around for questions at the end is it, with a lot of our shows now we're doing uh, console controlled follow spot stuff. So we're using moving lights or using lusters or something as, as follow spot units where they're still manually operating the pan and tilt and have an iris and a dimmer control, but we're doing things like color, limiting the maximum intensity, we're changing the edge. So we did a production of Hairspray uh, last summer and uh, for Big Doll's House, if you're familiar with the show, we had a follow spot cue on every single line of that song. And we only had maybe a day and a half to tech it. So that would be impossible to do. Like we would have changed the design if we didn't have this technology at our, to our, at our disposal. Um, but we were able to basically tell the operators, here's your track. You're going to follow these people throughout this song. And all you got to do is be on the right person. Your light's going to turn on in this time code automatically. All zero counts. You know, there's like 70 cues just back and forth, back and forth. It was really cool. Um, so it allowed us to do this really intricate time, this really intricate synchronization of, of, of lights and follow spots and audio and stuff like that. So, okay. Um, and then finally we get to opening night. So this is a kind of a bad picture of this particular one, but opening night in the park is a, a big gala fundraiser. So they do a silent auction for their uh, education programs. They raise a lot of money uh, for, for their programs that they run throughout the year. Uh, you know, they put tables out there. Typically when the show runs, it's all blankets and lawn chairs and stuff like that. But on this night, there's a catered dinner, there's free wine, there's free beer. Um, it's a lot of fun. It's actually the wrong show. I'm going to delete that from the slide. And then finally, it all gets taken down. So here's a view. You can see where it was. You can see the dressing room still over there, those portable trailers. And you can see kind of this like dead grass spot where the stage used to be. And then a couple months later, it's a, it's a, it's a field again, and it's all gone. Uh, and here's a couple of the production photos from it. Um, so we did LEDs on the back that were really cool. Uh, and moving lights allowed us to finally get some like actual gobos out there. So we did some window gobos on some things. We had regular follow spots, so they weren't computer controlled. We were, fingers crossed, we were trying to get some robo spots this year, but te technology is still a little too new, a little too expensive. Uh, it was like half the budget just for that. So we said no. Um, and then, yeah, I did a, uh, 
So uh, th th this is my last slide for now. I did a, uh, an Instagram takeover while I was there. So I'm going to let this play in the background and kind of take questions now. We're way over the time that I thought this was going to take. So I apologize for that. Um, but if you have any questions, if you want to jump on video, just hit the hand raise button and or you can tech, put your question in the chat and I'll answer it. Oh, here they come. Uh, when, do you, when do you start, where do you even start when you first get the white model? Uh, so on this particular show, again, because we do it every year, we kind of know what systems we're going to have. We know we're going to have a front light system. We know we're going to have a backlight LED system. Um, and so really it's, it's about figuring out how to make those systems that we usually use work with whatever the set is going to be for that year. Um, but on a bigger level, when I'm doing any show, uh, it's kind of the same thing, right? So I'm looking at what the scene designer is working with. A lot of times, I, I love to be a part of that process from the beginning. I love collaborating with scene designers so that I can make sure that I have the real estate I need to put the gear that I want where I want it. Um, I've had designers who will, or scene designers like, oh, here's a whole roof. I'm like, well, that's really cool. Going to make my life a little harder, but okay. Or like, you know, maybe there's a set of walls, but there's no, we can leave, maybe leave a little bit of hole in them or something like that. So I could do, I could do side lights, stuff like that. Um, but it's very much like examining that, examining the needs of the show versus what we have available versus the budget versus all of these things kind of all at the same time. Um, next question is, do LDs typically use Macs or Windows? It, it varies. I mean, I'm a Mac person. I, I was a Windows person all my life. And in 2008, I got my first Mac and it's off to the races from there. Most of my team all uses Macs as well. Um, but I mean, the, pretty much any, any software you're using in this industry, it works cross-platform now with the exception of, of some MA stuff. Um, Mac just, it works better for my workflow. Uh, it's just better, my mind works that way. But I, I had a, I have a, a little Windows machine that I use for configuration stuff as well. And on my last teaching gig, I actually had a, a Surface Studio, which I loved. Um, I wish that I could, it could have ran Mac OS, but that's fine. Um, do, do, do. Do you pick who your follow spots are? Or are they in-house or do they depend on the show? So typically, uh, most of the places I'm working at, they either have a house crew that they're going to be made up of or it's going to be from a, the IOTC local. Um, for all of those things, uh, you know, in Atlanta, we have a list of our four favorite follow spot ops that we've worked with. And so when we go and we do the show, we'll give that request list to our producer. Same thing for the board op. Like there are certain board ops that we really want to run the show because we know that they just get it. They get the music. They, you know, if the stage manager's off a little bit, we know that they're still going to hit it properly. Mm -hmm. uh, same thing with follow spots. Like uh, we'll give our request list, but if those people aren't available, then we're going to get who we get. Um, and in the park show, uh, I'm sometimes a little bit more involved finding people to help with that. Um, so, yeah. Do scene designers always provide a model that you can import to capture? What do you do at Previs if you don't have that resource? So no, uh, scene designers don't. I mean, I've done a show, I've done shows this year, well, this last 12 months here where the scene designer gave me hand draftings. Uh, Previs, I don't use Previs for every show that I do. I very much, I use Previs for the park. I use Previs for the city spring shows. And sometimes I'll use Previs to figure out, you know, like I'll look at Gobos or something like that. But I don't use it on every single theatrical project. And the reason is just because it's not good enough. Uh, it doesn't, like, it's designed for, Previs software is designed for concerts. Now I can do all kinds of cool stuff with, you know, a bunch of moving lights and just caring about color and angles and stuff. But as soon as you start throwing on, like, a, you know, a, a front wash of RO2 and, like, eight lights, it just doesn't work anymore. Uh, next question, do, 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 do. what are some resources you would recommend for learning time code and do you always need a click track for it to work effectively? <clears throat> uh, resources, I mean, on the, on the, it depends on the console. I would say, you know, for, if you're an EOS person, look at the manuals, look at the tutorials on that. Um, it's pretty easy to set up. Time code, you know, SMPTE time code is essentially just an audio file. So all you're doing is, is the sound department is sending us a, an audio feed of this god awful sounding, uh, like digital, or I don't know, if it, what, what, it's just a really bad sounding thing that the computers can listen to and know it, that it's time code. Um, and there's also mini time code we use sometimes. Uh, so that part of it, the whole technology side of it's easy. When it comes to learning, I mean, it's just, you know, again, look at the manual for the console that you're using and see how they, how they incorporate it. Uh, second part of that question is, do you always need a click for it to work effectively? Uh, it, kind of, it depends on what you're doing. So if you're using a live orchestra, I would not, I would not like use a time code track with a live orchestra 
without them having a click in their ear. And the reason for that is because if, if something drifts just a little bit, the whole thing is messed up. You know, I see a lot of people, uh, I've got a lot of people that they'll send me like, you know, oh, look at this, I did this cool time code thing. And it's just like a series of auto follows or something like that. But the second that your performer is off a little bit or that something gets delayed a little bit, your entire sequence is messed up. So don't do it that way. Um, we do a lot of like, we'll vamp time code. We'll, you know, if, 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 a, if, a, if a song has, you know, musical vamp in it or has a place where the music might drop out, we'll drop it out for a second and pick it back in. Like all kinds of stuff can be done like that. Um, we work with a couple of different people who program that specifically for the shows that we work on, not for us, but for the, for the production. Um, doo -doo 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 -doo. Next question. At what point in your career did you decide you say to your, at what point throughout your career did you decide to say to yourself, I need all of these pieces of software and equipment? Uh, very much gradually over the years. So like, it's not good to just go out and buy a bunch of stuff, right? Um, when I was in high school, all I wanted to do was buy a Maxis console because it was the coolest thing in the world. And I used one a couple of times and I thought it was just amazing. Uh, I'm gonna stop the slideshow over here. Um, I thought it was like the most amazing thing, right? Not at all. Uh, if I would have bought that back then, like I taken out loans or whatever would have been a bad idea because the Maxis isn't even around anymore. Um, so it was very much like, a, you know, as I needed stuff, I would purchase it or I would lease it or, or you know, rent it or whatever I might need for that particular project. Uh, most of the control stuff I've had, I've bought because of specific needs. Like I was doing shows at this theater in Florida all the time. Um, and I kept wanting to do time code stuff and they didn't want to buy a show control gateway. So I finally, I added it up. I was like, listen, I'm going to use it for X amount, whatever. I'll just rent it to these companies I'm working with. And I made my money back in like six months. I'm buying that. Uh, same thing for other stuff that I have software wise. Now that's a little bit different. So, um, software, you know, Vectorworks unfortunately is, is very expensive. Um, but it's kind of essential for what we do. Um, you know, if you're still in school, I recommend sticking with the educational license as long as you can. Um, you know, and then they'll, they'll, they'll reach a point in your career where you know, like, okay, I have to buy this now because you're going to get a project that like, okay, I have to give them, you know, for instance, I designed a, a rep plot for a major performing arts center. I had to give them an underwater marked file, you know, had to, had to buy Vectorworks. So there's no other way around it. Uh, so Lightrite, you know, in the grand scheme of things, Lightrite is probably one of the cheapest pieces of software there is in the industry. Um, use Lightwrite a lot still, FileMaker all the time, obviously, um, but very much need-based. I think I like to say I became a professional adult when I finally started paying for the Adobe Creative Suite instead of pirating it. Um, that was like eight years ago now, but that was my like crossover into the real world, I think, is when I, when I started paying for Photoshop and InDesign. Um, yeah. uh, do you have any resource suggestions for picking color and fixture positions? Um, Really, I mean, resource-wise, that's a hard question to answer. I think the best, the best, the best thing is experience and practice, right? So you're gonna, you're gonna, the more shows you do, and the more th times you experiment, the more things you're gonna learn. And that's why school is super important because you're gonna be able to to kind of work in a consequence-free environment and make those mistakes that you you couldn't make if you had a paying client or something like that. Um, as far as positions and angles and stuff like that, that's kind of part of another session that I'm going to do. I don't remember which one it is. It's, I think it might be in, I don't think I've announced that one yet. It's in my series though, where I talk about like how to determine and how to lay out a plot and stuff like that. So look for that probably in two weeks. I'll probably do something a little more in depth on that. Uh, and then picking color again, it's, it's very much a gut thing. Um, when I was starting out, like a lot of people, you know, you had to pick the color you wanted for the show because you had to buy the color and put it in the lights and it was expensive to change it. Uh, a lot, you know, young people now, I don't mean to sound this like, Oh, get off my lawn, but like you have an advantage where you've got all these LEDs and you can experiment kind of endlessly and you can say, all right, if this doesn't work, then I'm going to try this. That's great, but it also can lead you to get really carried away as well and, and to make decisions, you know, that don't necessarily make any sense uh, just because you can um, okay. Is it common for you to not be able to have meetings and collaborate with your team or the production team in general? Um, you know, yeah. I mean, I, I have a couple of shows that I've worked on, you know, I have, I have regular gigs now with mo I don't have a whole lot of new work coming in. It's a lot of recurring clients. So we have, you know, it, it doesn't happen as often, but I've certainly had clients in the past where like, 
it's almost like designing in a vacuum. You know, we have this initial production meeting and then I don't hear anything for weeks. Uh, and they're like, okay, well, go ahead and work on your plot. And then I'll like try to reach out to the scene designer, but there's not really, you know, so I've had those experiences and they're not fun because then you get into tech and everybody wants to be all collaborative and you're like, well, these are things we should have talked about two months ago. Like we tried to talk about this and it didn't work. Um, and my team and I, like we have, I mean, we, we talk almost every day just because we're annoying. Uh, we have a group chat, I message that we change the name of theme to whatever show we're working on. And, uh, you know, so we're in constant communication. Um, sometimes we, we use Slack on and off as well for communication, um, but I had a hard time getting anybody to, to want to do it. So I like Slack. Uh, another question, what are the benefits of FileMaker? I have tried it out, but I'd love to hear what you use the most for. So FileMaker is a database software. So it allows you to create relational databases uh, to manipulate a lot of information and manage a lot of information at once. So a lot of what we do, so the, the, when I started using FileMaker, it's because I was looking at all of these pieces of software that I was using. I was using Lightwrite, I was using Vectorworks, I was using Excel, I was using SpotTrack to do my follow spots. Like all of this stuff and all these separate programs, some of which could kind of talk to one another, but for the most part, nothing really talked to one another. And so I said to myself, like, why not have all this data in one place that, that then can cross-reference itself? You know, it's, it's beneficial to know, okay, in this follow spot or in this lighting queue, what follow spot queues do I have? Or this fixture is in this position and what work notes does it have associated with it? And et cetera, et cetera. So what I was able to do is I started out as just building like a work note tool where I could track my work notes. And that has blossomed into this whole other thing where I do work notes, I do queuing notes, we have queue sheets, follow spot sheets. Uh, it talks to the EOS, it does uh, all of my pre-production paperwork, et cetera, et cetera. I'm going to be talking kind of in depth. I'm going to do a demo on that on Sunday. Um, so if you check out my website, you can see that uh, it'll be another Zoom call. And I'm going to kind of like start at the top and go through it. Uh, it's like six years of development at this point. And one of the problems with it is, and everybody always asks, like, can I use it? Can I do it? And I always say no, because when I started, I had no idea what I was doing. And so like that base level code that's holding the whole thing together is like, it's like being held together with gaff tape and, and sticks at this point. So I need to like, maybe in, if this thing lasts longer, maybe I'll finally start rewriting it to make it distribute, distributable. But right now it's not. But my goal is that I can show you what I did and kind of show you how I did it. So if you're interested in creating a FileMaker thing for yourself, you can, you can accomplish that. So. Okay, um, so we still have a lot of people here. That's awesome. Thank you all for joining. I hope that somebody got something from it. Um, I'm gonna hopefully get better at this because again, I'm used to like working in a room of people and like talking back and forth. And so I feel like I talked kind of quickly and uh, it might've been a little confusing, but I'll get better as these, goes on, as these go on, I promise. Uh, but I'm happy to hang out for a few more minutes if anybody has any questions. Um, otherwise, I'll throw this thing up on, on YouTube as soon as possible, so. Oh, of course, thank you guys. Come check out my Instagram if you haven't already. Uh, so the link on my website, for those of you who are asking, if you go to mikewoodld.com slash classes, you'll find, I put a Google calendar there that I'm going to be putting all of the events that I'm going to do on. So you can, there'll be a, there'll be a link there uh, in, in the, in, in the information that you can, you can click on. I also, I, I kind of feel weird saying this. I started a Patreon um, to kind of help with some of the expenses of this. If you, if you, if you're in a position where you can, chip in a few dollars or whatever, please feel free to check that out. I'm not going to spam you all with it, but it's there on the website. Um, question, did I go to grad school? I did not go to grad school. Um, long story short, when I finished my undergrad, I was done with school. I wanted nothing else to do with school, which is dumb because I started teaching very quickly thereafter, but I just didn't want to do it. And then it kind of became a thing of like, I couldn't, I couldn't justify to myself taking three years out of my career to go back to school. Um, I looked at the University of Memphis has this cool like, uh, you know, remote program for working professionals where you only have to be on site for like a semester. But the problem with that is that then you have to pay fully because they're not going to give you an assistantship or a scholarship if you're not going to be there teaching for them. So, uh, so far in my career, it hasn't really hampered me at all. Um, 
you know, it's, it's disqualified me for some teaching gigs that I've wanted, but uh, there's been a lot that I've scored interviews for that don't require it. Um, I kind of look at it like if there's a place that, that I want to teach and, you know, if they require it, then oh well. And if not, then great. So I've got a couple, I've actually, fingers crossed, I've got a couple of interviews uh, in the next couple of weeks for some potential false teaching stuff. So we'll see. Uh, question is, Kevin, would love to more about know about my stamp slash stream deck setup. So I wrote a blog about this. Um, it's also mikewoodld.com slash blog. Uh, and that kind of is an in-depth look at how, what I did. I actually have sitting next to me right now my next whole project that I'm working on. This is a new audio box that I'm working on for my stamp rig. Uh, this is, um, this basically, if I get it close to the camera here, it's got a USB connection, a uh, four pin XLR, three pin XLR and then a 12 volt in. The inside has a little amplifier built inside of it and a little potentiometer to change the volume of the comm system. Uh, and then inside of it also, it's like a little tiny USB sound card. So what this basically is doing is I plug in a belt pack. So I have a, a comm belt pack. I take a four pin cable and I plug it into the four pin here. And then this acts as basically, think of it like a headset. So it, it takes anything that's coming over the, the headphone of the comm line, puts that into this tiny little sound card and injects it into my computer. And then anything that is coming out of the computer, it puts it into the microphone line of the comm system. So again, it requires a belt pack. It doesn't work like directly in line with the comm. Um, but the reason, it's because, the reason for that is because uh, we use a lot of, we, we go back and forth between like a telex system a ClearCom system and then like a HelixNet or a, a you know a FreeSpeak system. So we have to be able to just use whatever system we have and just get raw audio out of it. Then the three pin XLR is I get an audio feed from the sound uh, department. So uh, right now I had discovered a problem with this. The sound card that I have in here is, uh, is mono input and stereo out. So I actually, uh, tomorrow I'm gonna work on this. I'm gonna split this. I have another one of these. I'm gonna cram it all inside of there and it's going to, um, be able to give you two channels of audio instead of just the one. Um, so this is the prototype of the new one I'm making, and I'll, I'm gonna po I'll post about this once I get it built. But it's pretty cool. It works pretty well. Um, and before that, like all I had is like I, I built, and I, I have a picture of this on my on my blog. All it was before was just like a four pin thing, and I plugged it into a little M track that I had. Uh, but I got I, like it was just a lot of gear like to carry around, especially when I'm flying a lot. So like when this is all said and done. This, this tiny little box is gonna take the place of all of that gear. I'm able to just plug in a USB and I'm done. So fingers crossed that it works. The problem is I don't have a comm system to test it on. So uh, other questions here. How is my hold switch box working? Oh, so I should have brought this up. This was a cool project that I was working on uh, where one of my greatest frustrations in tech is when you know, you're sitting there, somebody calls a hold, typically the lighting department, um, and then the stage manager starts working on something else. Everybody's kind of doing their own thing. And then, you know, I'll say, okay, I'm ready. The stage manager says, okay, but they're still working on something else. And then five more minutes go by and like, what are we holding for? And we've been holding for nobody for five minutes. So what I worked on was doing, I worked on a reverse cue light system. So basically the lighting department, the sound department, and the director have these little boxes with a toggle switch on them. And it all connects together using Cat5 cable. It's using the copper, not it's not a not an IP-based thing at all. It's just using copper and sending 12 volts back and forth. And the stage manager has like a master panel with a red and green light for each department. And so, like if I need to hold, I flip my light to red, and when I'm ready, I flip it back to green. So they have a visual indicator of who's ready, who's holding, et cetera, et cetera. We used it for the first time at City Springs, and it worked really well. Um, unfortunately it was a show that didn't require a whole lot of holds. So I was the only one, like it didn't, you know, it was fine. Uh, but, uh, we're going to keep using it. And I eventually, once it's tested a little bit more and is working well, I will do some schematics for it and put that up on my site as well. Uh, another question, have I tried augmented yet? I have not. So that's on my list for this little quarantine time. Now I'm going to install it on my ION kind of over here. You can kind of see the blue light. I've got a, this is like my previs workstation. So I've got a TV there that I also watch Netflix on. My ion goes there, and I've got a Mac that I, I do previs with, so I'm gonna I'm gonna learn augmented in, the, in this interim time. Um, other other thing to point out, I'm also doing every Wednesday night, as long as this little situation lasts, we're gonna hosting a Zoom beer night. Um, information again on my website. Uh, we had like 13 people out last night. It was lots of fun. So grab a drink and come join us. 
Um, do, 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 do. Back from. <laughs> you're welcome to join if you're underage, because you know it's digital. So. Um, all right. Anybody else got anything? And I'm gonna go. Uh, we're doing quesadilla night tonight. Yeah, use a bottle of root beer. So, um, we're making quesadillas tonight, and tonight there's a new episode of Brooklyn Nine Nine. So it's like it's gonna feel like a regular night, which would be nice. So, all right, I'm gonna sign off. If anybody has anything else? Feel free to reach out on social media. Um, I hopefully will see you again on Sunday for my filemaker thing, and then I've got two paperwork things next week scheduled. So, talk to you all soon. Thank you. <laughs>